Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what, a, what a great pleasure it is to be here today. And uh, I'm thrilled to talk about creative innovation. It's a topic I'm enormously passionate about. But I've got to go back with a story. I've got to tell you about the origin of ideas. And for that, I must thank my brother. Because growing up, my brother was the idea guy. He had ideas every minute of every day. And some of those ideas led to adventure. Some of those ideas led to misadventure. There was a day where he told me, I was seven years old looking up to my big brother, he told me I could fly. And I was pretty excited about that because we, I always wanted to fly. We watched airplanes, we watched birds, and I thought, really? What do I have to do? And he said, well, it's easy. You have to climb to the highest branch on our tallest tree and then jump. But you don't just jump. When you jump, you have to jump this way, horizontally, because we all know jumping this way doesn't work. And so I'm going, uh-huh, OK. And flap your arms. Flap your arms as fast as you can. And I thought, I got this. I got this. So I walked to the tree. I climbed up. I jumped. I flapped, I fell, I did not fly. I did not fly. Instead, I, I broke my arm. But I learned something phenomenal from my brother that day, and that is that ideas are just ideas if you don't give it a try. I also learned that if you're gonna conduct a highly risky experiment, it's best to use a younger sibling as your <laughs> test subject. My hobby in high school was photography. So passionate about photography. I love being able to capture images, uh, moments in time to be able to share them later. And you might not totally get this if you're younger, but we actually had to wait to find out if we did, in fact, capture a moment in time because it was not the digital world we have today. I was lucky enough to volunteer at a local newspaper, and one day I got the uh, opportunity to be a summer student as a photographer at the local newspaper. And I was so excited about showing how awesome I was as a photographer. Now, of course, as a summer student, you don't exactly get the finest opportunities uh, that the newspaper has to offer. My biggest chance for creativity was the, was the weekly pet of the week. That's where you went to the dog pound. And this was in the country, so if they find a dog at the dog pound, it's usually pretty rough. And you had to make this poor guy look pretty good in order to get adopted. So high stress, right? That was my uh, big creative outlet. So it was very difficult, I found, to be able to stand out in an office full of photographers. But one day, we were laying out the newspaper. And that was, again, a very manual process. And I noticed we were spending a lot of time figuring out how to resize the photos. You'd have to measure the photo measure the spot that you had to put the photo in, and then again, send it back to another department to resize that photo, uh, whatever. And we had to look up the sizes in a little book where they had tables of all different sizes. And I thought, hey, I could write a little program that does that. Now this program was simple. If you guys go to Waterloo, you can follow along. It basically divides two numbers and multiplies by 100. If you go to the other university down the street, you may have to ask one of your <laughs> colleagues, but it's, it's not. It's, it's not hard math. So, but all of a sudden, I went from being a eh, summer student photographer, who invited him, to computer science rock star. I was a mathematical genius, because I could divide. So I learned that day the value and the importance of being able to bring another skill to the job, of being able to innovate outside of my core, outside of what I was there to do as a photographer. When I was in Toronto, there was a bridge I used to cross every day on my way to work. And it's a, if you know Toronto, it's a bridge that goes over the Don River. And on top of the bridge, in giant letters over this giant clock, it says, this river I step in is not the river I stand in. Now, I went over this bridge every day for many years before I figured it out what this actually meant. So I was a little bit embarrassed. And then one day, I was so excited, I had finally figured out 
what on earth this quotation meant. And I went into work and I remember talking to Luke. I said, Luke, you know that bridge? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You ever see the quotation on top? No, I haven't. Well, it's, it says, this river I step in is not the river I stand in. And, and I know what it's about. It's like, yeah, it's about time, isn't it? It's like, uh, yeah, how, how'd you know that? So I don't know if you ever had that experience where you're so excited that you figured something out and it's obvious to everyone else, but maybe the clock should have given it away. But it's about time. The river you step in is not the river you stand in because things are constantly changing. And I really love that quotation because it doesn't just hold for rivers. It also holds for business because the business we step in today isn't the same business we stand in tomorrow because business is constantly changing. And these days, companies around the world are looking to innovation, the art and the science of innovation to help them to succeed, to help them to have great businesses, differentiated businesses. And I'm here to talk about innovation, but what I want you to think about is we need to be more creative in where we innovate. And I hope you'll, uh, you'll see why in a little bit. Now, innovation means different things to different people, but the general idea is taking an idea that's new and useful and putting it into action. So you actually have to do something with the idea for it to be an innovation. How many people have heard the expression, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door? You heard that one? Yeah, it's not true. It's not true. There are over 4,400 US patents for mousetraps, all better and only a handful have ever made money. Now that's pretty incredible. Now maybe there was a time, if you think back, maybe there's a time when building a better mousetrap was in fact all you needed to do to succeed in business. Because when technology is new, when you first come out with something, when you give a, a capability to some, someone that they've never had before, they will buy that. They'll find that pretty interesting. But then something happens, something changes, it could be competing businesses, it could be competing technology, it might just be changes in, in the market, changes in the tastes and preferences of the marketplace, but something always changes, and so you need to innovate. But the key is, where do you innovate? And the natural anchor is to innovate in your core. The natural thought is to innovate where you're expected to innovate, to innovate where you've always innovated, to, to do what was successful for you in the past. And what I want to encourage you to do is think about looking beyond the core to truly harness the power of innovation. And I want to share a couple stories. They come from the cinema world, where I've spent most of my life working. The first one is from Christie, and I've been at Christie now for three years. And if you don't know Christie, it's a company, uh, the research and innovation team is uh, based here in Kitchener, but it's a global company and we're known for technological innovations in display systems. If you've been in see, to see a movie in the last few years, you've probably seen it on a Christie digital projector. The room we have here with its beautiful creative canvas is another Christie system, and uh, Nick here's a little nervous because it's, uh, this is actually the debut for that system, and <laughs> he wrote the software, and so he's, he's feeling pretty good now because this is the last talk, but uh, it's another example of a great creative canvas that we're able to provide. But the neat thing about the cinema world is that we had digital cinema projectors for a number of years, and the market wasn't that interested in adopting it. And the, the reason was quite simple, because movie theaters, the exhibitors, already had perfectly good film projectors. And the audiences, that's you, didn't really care whether they saw a movie on a film projector or a digital projector. And so that was a real challenge in terms of innovation. But along came a business model innovation, not a technical innovation, but a business model innovation that opened the floodgates for digital cinema, that overnight changed digital cinema's fate. And that business model innovation was known as the virtual print fee. And the way it worked was fairly simple. In fact, it was quite, quite ingenious. It aligned the interest of who benefited with who paid. Business 101. So, turns out the real benefit of digital cinema didn't fall to the exhibitors. It didn't fall to the audience. The real benefit to digital cinema fell to the distributors. They were the ones that would print films, 
cost about $2,500 to print a single film, and ship those films to the exhibitors. And if the world went digital, if the world went from film to digital, they would save a lot of money. And so what the virtual print fee did was this. It said, exhibitors, you can get projectors effectively for free. Yeah, you guys like free. That's the right price, always free, okay? Distributors, you're going to save money immediately. Put a portion of the savings aside to fund the purchase of the projectors over time, and now it's a win-win situation. The exhibitors got new projectors, distributors were saving money immediately. That's an incredible business model innovation that allowed a technological innovation to succeed. And overnight, Christie went from trying to sell digital cinema projectors to being working really, really hard to try to keep up with the worldwide demand to produce and ship digital cinema projectors. Fairly powerful. So I encourage that idea that if you really want to change the world, think about innovating beyond the core. If you're at that technology company, again, there's that incredible temptation to think that technology innovation is the only way to innovate, that surely the best technology always wins. And of course, we know that that simply isn't the case. My next example, though, raises the stakes a little. It suggests that even innovating in both business and technology sometimes isn't enough. And for that story, we have to go back in time. We have to go back to the 1890s in France to the Lumiere brothers. And if you've seen the movie Hugo or Hugo 3D, you will completely understand this story because they were featured in it. The Lumiere brothers were incredible. They were innovators like you couldn't imagine. They had created a device that served as both a motion picture camera and a digital, or not a digital cinema, but a film projector in one, same device. They even came up with this idea of a business model where they would set up a theater and charge admission for people to come in and see films. But after they wowed some early audiences with their you know, technological capabilities, they soon declared the following, that cinema is an innovation without a future. Wow, <laughs> glad they were wrong. Cinema is an innovation without a future. Well, that's not true. How could that be? How could two brothers so incredibly innovative in both business and technology have missed out on such an incredible opportunity? Well, it turns out the answer's up here. It's their content. They had 10 films in that first show, and the title of the first film, loosely translated into English, would be Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory. And literally, it is a film of workers leaving the factory, right? This is up there with University of Waterloo math students leaving the math building. <laughs> now in high frame rate, 3D. As exciting as that might be, although I did learn that they wore a lot of hats back then. They had other films. There was Fishing for Goldfish and The Sprinkler Sprinkled. That's my favorite. But they were missing the story. They were missing the creative element. They were missing that piece in cinema that links the business and technology to the hearts and minds of the audience. What a shame. But unbelievable in terms of the innovation and the contribution that they made to cinema. We're here today in Waterloo. Well, we're actually here in the city of Kitchener. Better get that one right. It's a place I'm very proud to call home but it does sit in the heart of the region of Waterloo. And this is an amazing story. You guys are all from the University of Waterloo, but I want to talk a little bit about the early history of the University of Waterloo, because you know Waterloo is an innovative university, but what I want to talk about is relentless innovation, because you have to go back to the founding of the University of Waterloo in 1957, and even the few years before that, to figure out why. Now, I know you're proud of the school, you guys have won the most innovative university in Canada for 22 years in a row. Now, I brought that up to the administration the other day. I said, you know, I graduated 22 years ago, and since then, every year you've won the award for most innovative university. Before, after, uh-huh. Uh, and uh, they thought about it for a while, and they said, 
No, 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 Paul, you got, you got it backwards. You got it backwards. Paul, it's while you were a student, after you left. <laughs> well, so, very innovative group. If you go back to 1957 and the years before, you find that this university was founded by innovation leaders. Innovation leaders from within this very community. People like you. Leaders largely from industry. And they were meeting a call, a call that said we need engineers, 150,000 engineers for Canada. There was a huge shortage at the time. So they came up with a plan. It was called the Waterloo Plan. And it's amazing to read that now and just think about what's happened in the years since. The Waterloo Plan called for a new kind of educational experience, one that was, one that was centered around cooperative education. And at its heart, it featured this idea that there would be two streams of students. And at the time, it was three-month terms. They would alternate between working in industry and studying in school. And the idea behind this was that instead of waiting four or five years for a stream of graduates to come to industry, industry would have access to graduates right away. Even better, industry would be able to shape what these graduates were learning and maybe steer a little bit of what they learned in school. For the university, it was fantastic because instead of being a university that operated nine months out of the year, they could operate 12 months out of the year, an incredible operational advantage. Not to mention the relevance of having uh, students going back and forth into the workplace in terms of what they learned. And for students, of course, it was incredible as well. Money, which I know you guys all like, so money, but also the ability to learn relevant skills, uh, knowledge, experience through the work terms. So it was pretty much working for everybody. It was an amazing plan, and that's, uh, that's uh, pretty innovative. So just think about, you know, when you talk about think big and how you can change the world, these were just people having a conversation about how they could meet a need and look where they are now, right? Look what happened, people within this community. Of course, the university continues to innovate. We see examples like what's happening with Velocity in terms of a residence for students, the place where uh, entrepreneurs can land here at the hub. You see examples like the new institutes for quantum computing and nanotechnology. Absolutely unbelievable innovation beyond the core and relentless innovation. But I will say the one that I am most excited about because it's closest to my field is what's happening in Stratford with a new digital media campus. The reason I think that's amazing, it's the perfect example of creative innovation because we talked about the need to link business, technology, and the creative arts. And here's a program that instead of deciding to be excellent in one area, it's bringing them all together under one roof. And that's the future of innovation. It's simultaneous innovation in multiple areas, something we call creative innovation. I want to leave with three things. The first is a bit of a caution, and then a reminder, and then a thought. The caution is, what is the caution? The caution, I know the caution. Oh, yes. I think the caution is, uh, is coming up this one. Even the best ideas won't matter if you don't put them into action. When my brother asked me to climb that tree, that's putting an idea into action. You've got to climb the tree. You've got to jump. Even the best ideas don't matter if you don't put them into action. So it speaks to the need to execute. The reminder is that we live in a changing world. Remember that bridge and remember that business is like that river. It's constantly changing. Don't be fooled by the status quo. You have to think about changing with it. And the thought is to think big, to think wide, and to innovate creatively. Thank you very, very much.